Hello, everybody. I'm delighted to be with you today to continue my discussion with you on cryptocurrency regulation. Today's webinar is the fourth of seven sessions I've been conducting on crypto regulation in Hong Kong and how and in what ways it compares to crypto regulation in other jurisdictions. Today, we will continue with the discussion of Hong Kong's crypto regulation with a focus on how and in what ways crypto regulation may evolve in Hong Kong in coming years. I'll then move to a comparison of Hong Kong's crypto re regulation to other jurisdictions, in particular China, Japan, and the US. So let's start the webinar. In the previous webinars, I've focused on the scope of Hong Kong's crypto regulatory regime, which, while being in its early days, is steadily developing into a more comprehensive framework. So first, may I recap the FATF requirements and Hong Kong's progress, and then I'll move on to some other developments relevant to Hong Kong. So the FATF requirements um, and how Hong Kong can bring its regulatory regime in line with the latest international standards I'll be covering, and then I'll look at some developments in the crypto sphere and what this will mean for Hong Kong going forward. So with regard to Hong Kong's current framework, the FATF requirements and the areas identified for improvement in the latest FATF Mutual Evaluation Report of Hong Kong, published in September 2019. Of that, the following are some areas which require the attention of Hong Kong's regulators. First, cryptocurrency exchanges, which provide for the trading of cryptocurrencies, which are securities or futures contracts, as defined in the SFO, are required to be licensed by the SFC under the SFO. Exchanges which only trade cryptocurrencies which are not securities or futures contracts are currently unregulated, but they will be regulated under the FSTB's proposals to license these exchanges as VASPs under the Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Terrorist Financing Ordinance, which um, is currently being consulted on. In some ways, Hong Kong's regulatory regime is more stringent than that required by the revised FATF recommendations. Exchanges licensed under the existing SFO regime and under the proposed AMLO regime are only allowed to serve professional investors. This is not a restriction imposed under the FATF requirements. Since many of the exchanges currently operating in Hong Kong on an unregulated basis are open to retail investors, the implementation of the proposed AMLO licensing regime will have significant consequences. Generally, however, the FSTB's proposed licensing regime is considerably narrower than that proposed by the FATF. The FSTB is only proposing to license virtual asset exchanges, whereas the FATF recommends licensing businesses involved in transferring virtual assets, providing safekeeping and or administrative services for virtual assets or instruments, enabling control over virtual assets, which includes certain wallet providers, or providing financial services related to the offer or sale of virtual assets, for example, ICOs. According to the FSTB's consultation paper, the AMLO regime will initially only apply to virtual asset exchanges, which are the most prevalent type of crypto-related businesses in Hong Kong. There are apparently relatively few businesses in Hong Kong conducting only virtual asset payment or custodian business, and the FSTB therefore does not propose to license them at this stage, but will keep the situation under review and may expand the activities covered by the AMLO's licensing regime in future. Now turning to some other developments and what they mean for Hong Kong going forward. First is the landmark announcement by PayPal on 21st of October 2020 that its US users will be able to buy and sell some cryptocurrencies, initially Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum and Litecoin using their PayPal accounts, a feature which was rolled out in late 2020. While it isn't entirely clear when these new services will be rolled out internationally, PayPal did indicate that it would be expanding to certain international markets in the first half of 2021, with PayPal also announcing the features would be expanded to Venmo. PayPal also announced on the 21st of October 2020 that they had been granted a first-of-its-kind conditional bit license, which I'll talk about a bit more later on, by the New York State Department of Financial Services. 
A conditional bit license is a stepping stone to a full license and requires the conditional license holder to partner with a company holding a full bit license, in this case, Paxos Trust Company, a regulated provider of cryptocurrency products and services. Additionally, starting in 2021, users will also be able to pay for goods in cryptocurrency from the 26 million sellers around the world, which accept PayPal, albeit the crypto will be converted to fiat at a rate of 2.3% per transaction for transactions less than 100 US dollars. And PayPal also plans to offer educational content to account holders to help them better understand cryptocurrency and the crypto ecosystem, a move aimed at increasing consumer adoption. So how did this announcement impact Bitcoin prices? Unsurprisingly, prices rose sharply. And it's no wonder, as this development really is something to be excited about. With roughly 487 million users, PayPal is effectively bringing crypto to the mainstream audience. And as a trusted payment and remittance provider, PayPal's embrace of crypto could bolster crypto's reputation and give it wider access to mainstream users. But what about Hong Kong? And what does this mean for Hong Kong users? Well, as I mentioned, initially only US users will be able to buy, sell and hold cryptocurrency with their PayPal accounts. For now, Hong Kongers will have to continue with in-person trades through platforms such as localbitcoins.com and Paxful. Bitcoin ATMs, which are arguably the most convenient way to buy Bitcoins at the moment, Bitcoin exchanges, which are often the cheaper options, Hong Kong exchanges such as Tide Bitcoin Super or Weaver, OTC exchanges for larger amounts, and some overseas exchanges, which serve the Hong Kong market, which some people think, although being more expensive, may, may be more reliable. As for paying in cryptocurrency in Hong Kong, there have been a number of crypto point of sale or POS devices deployed by startups in Hong Kong, such as Alchemy's hybrid POS solution that allows people to pay with more than 30 digital assets and was launched across Hong Kong, Japan and Singapore. 2018 also notably saw Pundi X, a Singapore-based startup, partner with Hong Kong's Pharma Group to enable customers of the restaurant chain to pay in crypto through the Pundi X POS device. Other than these developments a few years ago, there hasn't been too much progress in Hong Kong with respect to bringing crypto payments mainstream. However, it will be interesting to see the impact PayPal's announcements will have on Hong Kong's crypto payment ecosystem. A second development I think is worth noting is, as I mentioned in one of the earlier webinars, digital currency projects. For example, China's Digital Yuan, which it's developing and has preliminarily deployed. As for Hong Kong, the HKMA explored project Inthanon Lion Rock, a digital currency project in conjunction with the Bank of Thailand back in 2019, and published the findings of the research in January 2020. The project has now entered phase two, involving trials of cross-border trade payments between banks and corporates from both sides. And in fact, in September 2020, it was announced that Consensus, a blockchain software technology company headquartered in the US, was selected by the HKMA to lead phase two, with other members of the consortium being PwC and Forms Sintram, a Shenzhen-based fintech company. What's perhaps most striking is the stark difference between Hong Kong's digital currency project and China's digital yuan, a comparison which demonstrates just how diverse digital currencies can be. For example, while China has very clearly focused the digital yuan at the retail market, with Shenzhen handing out a total of 10 million yuan of the digital currency in a lottery in October 2020 for recipients to use at over 3,000 shops, Hong Kong's digital currency initiative is for now restricted to wholesale institutional use. The development of each digital currency is also very different. While Hong Kong has been working collaboratively with the private sector, China's digital yuan has been very much under the control of its central bank, the PBOC, and these diverging pathways can also be seen in the tech underlying the digital currencies. 
while Hong Kong and other jurisdictions such as Thailand and Australia are developing CBDCs using distributed ledger technology, China's digital yuan is based on a government-run centralized network. Hong Kong has expressed willingness to collaborate on China's digital yuan project. In October 2020, Hong Kong's Financial Services and Treasury Secretary Christopher Hoy noted that the Hong Kong government was exploring a possible collaboration with mainland authorities on China's digital yuan project and indicated a particular interest of the government and the HKMA in the application of the digital yuan to cross-border payment, which feeds into the increasing connectivity between the mainland Hong Kong and the Greater Bay Area as a whole. This statement followed China's Commerce Ministry announcing in August 2020 that Hong Kong was one of the cities in which they may test the digital yuan. As a global offshore RMB hub, Hong Kong is primed for trials of the digital RMB. Since Hong Kong already has an efficient retail payment infrastructure, the deployment of a digital currency in Hong Kong would most likely be aimed at the wholesale and cross-border payment level. On the other hand, the Hong Kong dollar is the main currency used locally, and so it may be challenging for the digital yuan to break into the consumer market, particularly in view of the prevalence of Alipay Hong Kong and WeChat Pay Hong Kong, which allow users to easily use Hong Kong credit cards to make payments in Hong Kong. So that largely concludes my discussion of Hong Kong's crypto regulation. And now I'm going to turn to a comparative analysis of other jurisdictions, the US, China, Japan, the UK, Malta, and Gibraltar, in order to assess how Hong Kong's crypto regulatory regime compares with these other jurisdictions. And I'm not just going to look at jurisdictions taking a progressive stance, for example, Japan, the first jurisdiction to legalize virtual assets as a legal means of payment, but also those at the other end of the spectrum, like China, one of the main jurisdictions to have declared ICOs to be illegal. We'll also look at how Hong Kong's regime compares to the US, one of the first jurisdictions to see ICOs and virtual asset trading platforms take off. The US regulators were then among the first to apply existing laws and regulations to clamp down particularly on cases of fraud, but also on ICOs offering virtual assets with the features of traditional securities and ICOs marketed as money-making investments. We'll also compare Hong Kong's crypto regulation and regulatory approach to other smaller jurisdictions, in particular Gibraltar and Malta, which have implemented bespoke regulatory regimes for virtual assets aimed at fostering their development as virtual asset hubs. So let me first take a look at the different regulatory approaches. The Cambridge Centre for Alternative Finance identified four principal types of regulatory response to virtual assets. First, there's the application of existing regulation. This is the approach that many regulators have adopted, which involves applying existing laws and regulations to activities involving virtual assets by issuing regulatory guidance on how existing laws apply to those activities. Examples include Australia's information sheet on ICOs and cryptocurrency and Hong Kong's statement on security token offerings, which I talked about before. Second, there's the retrofitted regulation. This involves extending existing laws and regulations to cover activities involving virtual assets. Interestingly, according to a study by the CCAF, countries with a higher level of domestic crypto asset activity typically take this approach. Of course, retrofitting regulation has its drawbacks, mainly the fact that distributed ledger technology compares so starkly to traditional centralized systems. However, this approach is attractive to many jurisdictions, seeing rapid development of crypto activity. Third, there's bespoke regulation. As I mentioned, a few smaller jurisdictions have taken this approach by enacting new law specifically to regulate virtual asset activities. An example is Malta's Virtual Financial Assets Act. Interestingly, the CCAF study which I mentioned found that generally places like Malta, Gibraltar, Luxembourg, and so on, have been able to develop these bespoke crypto regimes due to their relative lack of crypto asset activity. 
Finally, there are bespoke regulatory regimes. This entails establishing a distinct regulatory regime applicable to a type of activities, often fintech activities, of which virtual asset activities are one type. So let me look at the position in mainland China and how their approach compares to the approach in Hong Kong. As I briefly mentioned, China has imposed severe restrictions on cryptocurrencies. A ban on banks and payment institutions dealing in Bitcoin has been in effect since 2013. ICOs were banned in September 2017, and all ICOs were ordered to cease immediately, and money already raised had to be refunded to investors. The regulators declared ICOs to be an unauthorized illegal fundraising activity and stressed that virtual assets issued in ICOs do not have legal status equivalent to that of fiat currencies and should not be used and circulated in the market as currencies. The ban was then extended to security token offerings and airdrops in December 2018. Before the crackdown, 80% of the world's cryptocurrency transactions and ICO financing took place in China, with ICOs in China raising at least 2.62 billion yuan, around 400 million US dollars. This compares to the position in Hong Kong, where, as I discussed in a previous webinar, ICOs are not prohibited. The SFC determines their regulatory status on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on whether the ICO tokens constitute securities, with the SFC preventing only one ICO to date, Black Cell Technologies ICO in 2018. Crypto trading platforms are also banned through various prohibitions, for example, on exchanging fiat currency for virtual assets, buying or selling virtual assets, setting virtual asset prices, and providing information and intermediary services in relation to virtual assets. Meanwhile, in Hong Kong, crypto trading platforms can and do operate and can be licensed by the SFC if they trade at least one crypto asset, which is a security. Subject to the FSTB's latest proposals being adopted, centralized crypt crypto exchanges operating in Hong Kong will also be required to be licensed. Online access to offshore IPO ICOs and crypto exchanges has also been blocked in China. And on the 15th of February 2019, China's internet regulator, the Cyberspace Administration of China, announced new regulations which took effect on the 15th of February 2019, which apply to blockchain information service providers, which broadly are entities using blockchain technology to provide online information services to the public. The new regulations impose restrictions similar to those applying to China's mobile payment service providers and clamp down on blockchain anonymity with requirements for users to provide their real names and national ID card numbers or phone numbers when registering for a blockchain service. Blockchain service providers need to register with the government and are required to censor content, quote, deemed to pose a threat to national security, unquote. They must also keep a record of information published by users and disclose this information to the government. The new regulations appear to target the use of blockchain technology to bypass China's um, control of the internet following cases of individuals posting information on the Ethereum blockchain. As for Bitcoin mining, it has not yet been banned in China, although there were plans to, plans that were subsequently abandoned. Despite this, China's miners account for around 72% of the average monthly Bitcoin hash rate. That is the computing power dedicated to supporting the network. It is, however, becoming more challenging for Bitcoin miners to operate in China, with a recent crackdown on OTC brokers. As a result, many have and are moving operations overseas and others are shutting down operations altogether. By comparison, there are no specific regulations in relation to mining cryptocurrencies in Hong Kong and no guidance has been issued discouraging mining activities. Although depending on the scale and specifics of the mining operations, Regulation that applies to other similar activities, such as data centers, may apply to mining. Despite China's somewhat prohibitive approach to cryptocurrencies, China has launched a digital currency project known as the Digital Currency Electronic Payment, or the Digital Yuan, 
a CBDC controlled and issued by the People's Bank of China, PBOC. The digital yuan is essentially a digital version of the RMB to be used for everyday banking activities. It's currently on trial in four major cities and is said to simplify digital payments and interbank transfers. China is, of course, very familiar with mobile payment systems and is already, to a large degree, operating as a very advanced and cashless society, which is in part due to Alibaba's Alipay and Tencent's WeChat Pay. With the introduction of the digital yuan, China will become the first country in the world to put a central bank digital currency into use. As I mentioned earlier, Hong Kong has been researching a central bank digital currency, but the focus is on its potential for use in wholesale and cross-border payments. At the opposite end of the spectrum, Japan is one of the most progressive jurisdictions in terms of crypto regulation. Japan was the first country to recognize cryptocurrencies as a legal payment method in April 2017 with the revision of its Payment Services Act. And Bitcoin is widely accepted by Japanese retailers and also for payment of utilities bills. For example, in 2019, the CoinCheck gas service was launched, which allows users to pay their gas bills using Bitcoin. CoinCheck gas was the result of a collaboration between the CoinCheck Virtual Currency Exchange and the energy company Enet Systems. This collaboration enables users of CoinCheck to pay for their gas bills using Bitcoin. In Japan, crypto assets are treated as assets which can constitute means of payment rather than as legal currencies. This compares to the position in Hong Kong, where cryptocurrencies are also not treated as currencies or legal tender, but rather virtual commodities. They are, however, often referred to as virtual currencies. Further, as early as 2017, the Japanese National Tax Agency released guidelines on tax treatment of virtual assets. In Hong Kong, the IRD issued DIPN 39 in March 2020, providing broad guidance and clarity on the tax treatment of virtual assets. In relation to crypto exchanges, Japan's Financial Services Authority licenses and regulates virtual asset exchanges, subjecting them to money laundering regulations. As crypto asset exchange services are broadly defined, other service providers engaging in crypto activities must also register with the FSA, including crypto custodians. Crypto asset exchange service providers must not engage in activities relating to security tokens as these activities are governed by the Financial Instruments and Exchange Act, and additional licensing is required. As of March 2020, there were 23 approved crypto exchanges in Japan, one being OKCoin, OK once one of China's big three crypto exchanges, which moved to the US following the 2017 ban. A number of exchanges were licensed initially, however, following the hack of Tokyo cryptocurrency exchange CoinCheck in January 2018, which saw almost 500 million US dollars in digital tokens stolen. The FSA tightened its screening of crypto exchanges, and with the cost involved with licensing increasing, many firms withdrew their licensing applications and ultimately no exchanges were licensed for a year. One firm with which withdrew its application was Payward Japan, which operates Kraken Exchange. Kraken withdrew entirely from the Japanese market in 2018 as a result of the crackdown, but recently re-entered and has since been awarded a license. Further to amendments to the FIEA, which took effect in May 2020, security tokens and ICO tokens are classified as electronically recorded transferable rights. As a result, they're not considered crypto assets, which as I mentioned, are regulated by the PSA. ERTRs are themselves classified as type one securities and licensing requirements, therefore apply to the broker, issuers and ICO operators, and ICOs must be handled by a licensed securities company. If the tokens offered do not represent investment contracts, um, i.e. that's in the case of utility tokens, the offering is regulated by the PSA. In this case, the issuer is required to register as a crypto asset exchange service provider or can sell the tokens via a registered exchange. 
This compares to the position in Hong Kong, where ICOs involving tokens which are not securities are unregulated. Another major change following the amendments to the PSA and the FIEA taking effect in May 2020 was that crypto asset related derivative businesses are now regulated under the FIEA. Previously, the Japanese derivative regulations did not apply to crypto assets as they weren't included in the definition of underlying assets to which the regulations apply. As for Hong Kong, which is quite a dominant player in the crypto derivative space, with most of the derivatives trading volume deriving from exchanges based in Hong Kong, this area remains largely unregulated. However, this may change if the FSTB proposals are adopted. In summary, the Japanese market is highly regulated, irrespective of whether the token is a crypto asset under the PSA or otherwise, which compares to Hong Kong, where large parts of the crypto market remain unregulated. Now I'll turn to a comparative analysis of the position in the US. Please remember I'm not a US lawyer and this is based on my understanding of the position. The regulatory position in the US is complicated and cryptocurrency related activities potentially fall within the jurisdiction of a number of US federal regulators. The SEC may regulate them as securities, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission classifies them as commodities, and the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network may treat them as currency. Crypto assets can also be regulated as virtual currencies so that the guidelines of FinCEN apply to administrators and exchanges, which need to be registered with FinCEN as a money service business and comply with regulations aimed at countering money laundering and terrorist financing. FinCEN has brought criminal and civil enforcement actions against cryptocurrency businesses for failure to register and non-compliance with anti-money laundering procedures. State regulators also regulate various activities, for example, New York's bit license. New York State has been active in terms of regulation and requires any business engaging in the transmission, trading, custody or issue of a virtual currency to obtain a bit license. Licensees have to satisfy requirements including a minimum capital requirement and an anti-money laundering and know your client requirements. As of June 2020, the state of New York had issued 25 bit licenses, including to Hong's XAPO holdings. As a result, the jurisdiction of US agencies frequently overlaps, and this has led to allegations of excessive and unclear regulation, which is stifling the development of virtual asset technologies. So let's look at the regulation itself. On the 16th of November 2018, the SEC issued a statement on digital asset securities issuance and trading, setting out its views on three principal areas relating to digital assets, ICOs, investment vehicles investing in digital asset securities, and trading of digital assets. So first I'll look at the regulatory treatment of ICOs. The US SEC has repeatedly said that virtual assets may qualify as securities and that ICOs thus need to comply with US securities laws, in particular the 1933 Securities Act. This is comparable to Hong Kong's approach, which regulates ICOs where the virtual assets constitute securities under the SFO. So there are registration requirements requiring the registration of an ICO in the US as a public securities offering although exemptions are available under Regulation A plus and D. Blockstack was the first company to conduct an ICO under the Regulation A plus exemption in September 2019. The SEC has taken enforcement action against a number of ICOs as unregistered securities offerings. Examples include Simply Vital Inc., ICO Box, and the original landmark case involving the DAO tokens, which I'm going to look at in more detail in a minute. However, in spite of SEC statements suggesting that all ICOs are securities offerings, the US enforcement actions based on securities law violations have involved cases where explicit statements were made that token holders could expect to receive a profit. 
This raises the question of whether it was the explicit promotion of the ICOs as something that would increase its value that resulted in them being targeted by the SEC rather than the utility token features which are part of their structure. Without the express statement suggesting the ability to make a profit from the tokens, the ICOs may not have amounted to a securities offering. Comparably in Hong Kong, the SFC has halted only one ICO, the ICO of Black Cell in March 2018, which I talked about earlier, on the basis that making the tokens available to Hong Kong investors constituted potential unauthorized promotional activities and unlicensed regulated activities, and that the sale of the tokens in the proposed manner may constitute a collective investment scheme. In that case, it was, however, fairly clear that the tokens were securities, since they were redeemable for black cell shares. So let me have a look at the Dow case in a bit more detail. In July 2017, the SEC released a report which said that Dow tokens offered and sold by a virtual organization called the Dow were securities under the Securities Act of 1933 and the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. Dow tokens were offered in exchange for Ether, and the ETH raised would be used to fund projects. Under the Howey test, an investment contract, which is a security, is an investment of money in a common enterprise with a reasonable expectation of profits to be derived from the entrepreneurial or managerial efforts of others. The Dow met all the requirements of the Howey test. Purchasers of Dow were found to have invested with a reasonable expectation that they would receive a return in the form of a share of the profits from the projects funded by the Dow. The promotional materials informed investors that they would share in the profits of the projects funded by the investment. Token holders could also monetize their investment by reselling Dow tokens in the secondary market. Profits were also derived from the entrepreneurial or managerial efforts of others, as profits for investors were generated by the managerial efforts of Slock.it and its co-founders, in putting forward project proposals. The Dow ICO was, however, unusual in that it was essentially a tokenized fund and so fell fairly squarely within the definition of a security. The regulatory position is perhaps less clear in relation to utility tokens, which proliferated in the wake of the Dow report. Subsequent statements from SEC officials suggested that all ICOs are securities offerings except for Bitcoin and Ether, which are regarded as commodities, as, in, as is the position in Hong Kong. However, the SEC has indicated that cryptocurrencies can evolve from being securities to non-securities once the network on which they function is sufficiently decentralized so that purchasers no longer expect any personal group to carry out essentially managerial or entrepreneurial efforts as required by the Howey test. The key feature of a utility token is that rather than entitling holders to a share of the profits from investments, they typically provide a right of access to a specific product or service provided or to be provided by a DLT platform. But as became clear in SFC enforcement actions, merely calling something a utility token doesn't mean it's not a security if it is in fact marketed as an investment product as was determined in the enforcement action relating to the Munchie ICO. Similarly, in Hong Kong, the SFC 2018 statement appeared to recognize that utility tokens are not generally securities under the SFO. However, there's no legal definition of a utility token in Hong Kong, nor is there any Hong Kong case law or guidance from the regulators on the characteristics of an ICO token that might cause it to be considered a security. One of the most high-profile recent regulatory actions in the U.S. is the U.S. SEC's December 2020 action against Ripple and two of its senior executives for allegedly conducting a U.S. dollar $1.3 billion unregistered securities offering of XRP tokens, the world's fourth largest cryptocurrency by market cap, which were offered to investors in the U.S. and worldwide in 2013 allegedly in breach of the U.S. Securities Act of 1933. Ripple also distributed billions of XRP in exchange for non-cash consideration, such as labor and market-making services. 
Following the announcement, Coinbase, Bitstamp, OKCoin, and Hong Kong-based OSL suspended trading in XRP, with XRP subsequently falling by 31%. The SEC complaint alleges that XRP is an investment contract within the Howey test and is therefore a security subject to the registration requirements of the Securities Act. It notes that, if, that the defendants understood and acknowledged in non-public communications that the principal reason for anyone to buy XRP was to speculate on it as an investment. In particular, in publicly offering and selling XRP, Ripple allegedly promised to undertake significant entrepreneurial and managerial efforts, including to create a liquid market for XRP, which would in turn increase demand for XRP and therefore its price. Ripple has disputed the allegation that XRP is an investment contract and has described the SEC act action as an assault on crypto at large. Ripple's main arguments are that XRP is a currency similar to Bitcoin and Ether, which the SEC has determined are not securities, and XRP as a fully functional ecosystem and a real use case as a bridge currency that does not rely on Ripple's efforts for its functionality or price. It therefore differs from earlier ICO cases, which did not have developed ecosystems or an established utility for the digital assets, which were sold to purchasers based on promises of profits and ongoing efforts. A commentator on Forbes noted that the long-term effect of the SEC's action may be a broader shaking out and differentiation between ICO products and digital tokens resembling the analog governance models of before versus truly decentralized models of governance. It could also lead to businesses avoiding the US legal system. Ripple has reportedly been looking for new headquarters outside the US due to the lack of regulatory clarity. Countries under consideration reportedly include Japan and Singapore. Other recent and high-profile enforcement actions include those brought against Kik and Telegram. In both cases, the SEC alleged that Kik and Telegram tokens were securities with the meaning of, within the meaning of US securities laws, with the token offerings therefore being unregistered securities offerings. Both Kik and Telegram structured their offerings as SAFTs, Simple Agreements for Future Tokens, a concept which attempted to skirt US securities laws by distributing tokens after the launch of the blockchain network. Hence, the tokens would be considered utility tokens. In the case of Telegram, the US dollar 1.7 billion token sale was determined to be an unregistered security offering, despite Telegram's argument that the tokens, known as grams, were currency. In agreeing with the SFC that the tokens were securities, the court determined that there was a common enterprise and that a reasonable initial purchaser would have purchased grams with investment intent and an expectation of profit, citing the testimonies of purchasers and various other facts. It was also found that this expectation was based on the essential entrepreneurial and management efforts of Telegram. This finding was based on various facts, including that grams did not exist at the time of the sales, purchasers provided capital to fund the development of the TON blockchain in exchange for the future delivery of grams, expecting to resell them for a profit, and that the offering materials emphasized Telegram's commitment to developing the project. The court further found that Telegram failed to demonstrate that it was exempt from the registration requirements under Regulation D, which provides an exemption for registration of securities offered in private sales to accredited investors. This was based on the finding that Telegram did not intend grams to remain with the initial purchasers, but intended them to reach the public via post-launch resales by initial purchasers, who the court found were underwriters. The Kik decision followed, with the court largely adopting the same reasoning. The Kik case differs from Telegram's though, as Kik's tokens, known as KIN, were offered in both a pre-sale to a limited number of accredited investors and a public sale, which Kik argued were two distinct transactions. The court ultimately concluded that both transactions were integrated and constituted an unregistered securities offering based on, in short, the fact that Kik pooled the proceeds from its sales of KIN in an effort to create an infrastructure for KIN and thus boost the value of the investment. 
The SEC November 2018 statement also set out the SEC's views on funds that invest in digital asset securities, saying that funds investing in crypto assets that are securities must be registered under the Investment Company Act and that the managers of the investment vehicles must observe the registration, regulatory and fiduciary obligations under the Investment Advisors Act. The first crypto fund to register was the ARCA US Treasury Fund in July 2020, a fund which invests in short-term treasury securities with investors holding their shares in AR coins, an ERC-1404 token. This approach is broadly comparable to Hong Kong's approach, where managers of funds investing 10% or more of their GAV in virtual assets are required to be registered for Type 9. However, unlike the US, this applies whether or not the virtual assets are securities or futures contracts. Licensing requirements also apply to the distributors of virtual asset funds, which require a Type 1 license. Finally, the SEC statement addressed the trading of digital asset securities, outlining that a trading platform which offers trading of crypto assets which are securities and which operates as an exchange as defined under federal securities laws must be registered with the SEC as a national securities exchange or be exempt from registration. An exemption is available for an alternative trading system which is registered with the SEC as a broker-dealer and becomes a member of a self-regulatory organization, such as the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, FINRA. FINRA has reportedly only approved a few of the many crypto broker-dealer applications it's received. This is again comparable to Hong Kong's current approach, with the SFC licensing exchanges which trade at least one security token. Crypto trading platforms are also regulated by other agencies at both federal and state levels. For example, a crypto exchange may be subject to regulation by the CFTC if it allows certain regulated commodities transactions or swaps in crypto assets. FinCEN also requires businesses involved in buying cryptocurrency from or selling it to customers or transferring cryptocurrency on behalf of customers to register with FinCEN as money services businesses. The latest statement from the SEC came on the 23rd of December 2020, when a statement was issued regarding the custody of digital asset securities by broker-dealers and compliance with Rule 15C33, also known as the Customer Protection Rule. The SEC has long questioned whether digital asset custodians can effectively comply with the Customer Protection Rule and broker-dealer custody was therefore prohibited. The statement is therefore a huge breakthrough as it provides a path for crypto-focused broker-dealers operating in certain circumstances to operate free from a possible SEC enforcement action on the basis that the broker-dealer deems itself to have obtained and maintained physical possession or control of customer fully paid and excess margin digital asset securities. The statement is effective for a period of five years while the SEC determines how best to regulate this area. The final development I'll talk about um, is the new rules for crypto wallets that were proposed by the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, announced on the 18th of December 2020. However, following President Biden taking office in mid-January, the proposals were in fact frozen, effected by a general freeze placed on all FinCEN rule making pending review. It's understood that the freeze is not so much aimed at halting the substance of the rules, but ensuring that Biden's appointees have sufficient time to review the rules, with the freeze being effective for at least 60 days from the 20th of January, 2021. The crypto market does, however, seem optimistic about a clear regulatory framework under the new uh, administrative regime in the US. So let me take a brief look at the proposals and the criticisms. The new rules are aimed at addressing AML gaps in digital asset transactions by imposing obligations on virtual asset service providers, VASPs. VASPs would be required to record the name and address of wallet owners in the case of deposits and withdrawals exceeding 3,000 US dollars where a non-custodial wallet is involved and VASPs would be required to report any deposit or withdrawal greater than $10,000 to FinCEN 
through a currency transaction report. This would broaden the current AML regime, which only sees record keeping and reporting requirements imposed on vast to vast transactions. While different in scope, the focus on tightening AML regulation is also in focus on Hong Kong, in Hong Kong, which has recently proposed amendments to the AMLO, as we know, to subject virtual asset exchanges which are not licensed under the F SFO to the AML requirements in Schedule 2 of the AMLO. Criticisms have been voiced by various parties, including eight Congress members who sent a letter to the US Treasury Secretary expressing their concerns. It's been argued that VASPs will face practical difficulties obtaining the required information and that it will adversely impact the effectiveness of existing AML regulation or simply may not tackle the very risks that they are seeking to tackle. For example, the new rules may easily be evaded by breaking transactions up into smaller amounts. Others went so far as to suggest that the proposed rules would place a break on the development of the industry in the US completely. The proposal goes further than the FATF travel rule, which I talked about in an earlier webinar, which imposes requirements in relation to the collection, disclosure, and transfer of beneficiary information when a VASP is transacting with another VASP. Um, so that brings me more or less to the end. Um, if you have any more questions, though, please email me on juliacharlton at charltonslaw.com. I will try to get back to you. So thank you very much for joining me today. As I mentioned earlier, this is part four of a seven-part webinar series. Webinar five will be on Friday, February the 5th at 5 p.m. Hong Kong time. And I'll continue then the comparative analysis of regulatory approaches to crypto around the world. I do hope you'll join me. You can find the link to register on our website. And for those of you who've already registered, I'm looking forward to seeing you on the 5th. Thank you very much and have a great weekend.